Hello everyone, many thanks for joining. My name is Paul Milligan from Innovate Magazine. Um, many thanks for joining us. We're just gonna leave it um, a few seconds just for people to uh, make sure everyone's logged in and everyone who's coming um, is here. So please bear with us, it won't be too long, I promise. Um, but yeah, many thanks for joining us today. Um, promises to be a really interesting discussion, I think very timely um, discussion on kind of hybrid learning. Um, the rise of IP-based lecture capture and, and micro broadcasting are so hugely relevant topics um, that we'll be touching on. Um, once again, many thanks for joining us. We're just going to leave it a few seconds. Um, I know it takes some people um, slightly longer to log in than others. We don't want anyone to miss any vital bits at the start, if we can. Um, so just leave it. I hope it's um, nice and sunny where you are. I'm currently in a heat wave in the UK, which is incredibly rare. Um, so we're all enjoying it for what it is, because it'll probably last about three days and then go again, or we're used to loads of rain. Um, so many thanks for joining us. So like I said, um, my name is Paul Mulligan from Innovate Magazine. Hopefully you're all subscribers and um, regular visitors to the website. Uh, if not, please um, change that immediately. <laughs> um, right, so where are we now? That's about a minute and a bit. Hopefully everyone's in. Um, so today the discussion will include insights from um, New Tech and Digivox, and we'll include discussions on how multi-input, multi-room recording and live stream technology is driving active participation, engagement and the experience for remote and hybrid learning. So hugely relevant topics for right now and obviously key in the last two years as well. I'm joined today um, by two very knowledgeable gentlemen, uh, Mark Risby from Digibox and Liam Hayter from Mutech. Um, take it away gents and we'll have a discussion um, after a sort of very brief presentation. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the intro, Paul. Um, I'm Mark Risby, um, as we've said, and I'm here with my colleague, Liam Hayter from Newtech. Um, we're going to, well, kick off, I think, Liam. Let's have a... Excellent. Thank you. Hey. What happened earlier? There you go. There we go. <laughs> so so if, if we kick off, just set the scene a little bit about where we are right now with education. So um, you know, to start with, the most important thing in education is clearly the students. Um, you know, we're dealing with people now that are definitely digital natives. We knocked that term around for quite a while, but I think when you look at an 18 plus year old now, or actually even younger, clearly they're native um, of every digital platform. They are the YouTube generation or the Netflix um, generation. Um, strangely, for some people who are a little bit older, of course, but now students are definitely fee payers, uh, certainly in, in higher education. Um, so they, are, they have literal skin in the game. They're taking out loans, they're putting in parental money or whatever, they are paying fees, so they are you know, effectively customers. Um, and, and they know what they want. Um, they want to use typically the devices that they know. They are very much, you know, on a phone, tablet, you know, and perhaps further down the line, actually, laptop. Um, you know, the, the, the iPad and the iPhone or, or the Android or whatever has been in their hand literally probably from three years old. So they want to use the devices that they know and love because you know, that is their world. From an institutional point of view, um, we, we are now definitely seeing that, you know, that how important video is and institutions want to you know, keep the quality of their output high because it reflects them as an institution and realizing how important that might be. And I think that you know, universities and colleges recommend, you know, recognize students as customers now. This is not a you know, unique or an old concept. They recognize that they've got to deliver to this new generation of people uh, you know, as if they are end users. Um, in most businesses. We're seeing that AV now um, is increasingly driven by IT departments. Mm -hmm. It very much in the past yeah. used to be a separate um, entity, but now the IT department you know, really controls perhaps either the budget strings or, or how those um, deployments happen within the standard IT infrastructure that's there. Um, and self-service is very important. People need to be able to, you know, uh, look after themselves and their devices, whether they're students mm -hmm. or whether they're teachers, as much as possible. Budgets are driven down in some ways, and by making things simpler, you need less feet on the street to actually make that happen. Um, then COVID arrived. <laughs> COVID changed everything. Um, COVID forced things to change, and, and institutions perhaps that weren't very video savvy or interested immediately had to do something to get their messages out and teach their students. Um, COVID let us try new things. You know, at, at this point, you know, we may have said, well, Zoom's not good enough for us, or I don't mm -hmm. want to use Teams, or I don't want to use Skype. All of a sudden, when there's no other choice, people will try, you know, anything, mm -hmm. and by and large, 
it worked. There's been a lot of iteration as well around that at the same time, you know, both the vendors and manufacturers as well as actual techniques that we were using uh, with a rapid, rapid pace. Absolutely. And even things like Teams have evolved over mm -hmm. that time. You know, it started a couple of years ago. It wasn't a particularly solid platform, but now it's turned into actually quite a good one. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've certainly seen that the, the big players have also stepped up there. And actually what COVID did was show us that video worked. It showed a lot of people who were skeptical that they could do an immense amount with video, even in the most basic form. So, you know, we know, uh, we know that video is, is the direction that people need to see. And this is a slide that um, I stole somewhere near the beginning of COVID, but I think it sums it up completely. Um, the, um, the feeling is that COVID drove seven years of transformation in just one year. It made people attempt things that they just weren't ready to in some ways, but actually the technology was there and ready to go. So actually, we've actually seen, you know, for all the badness of COVID and it was a terrible thing, it actually has driven a lot of change that will be there for the future and a lot of actually, you know, a, a good change uh, as well. So what does that mean? What does it look like? What, what are the requirements of any system that, that we have um, to deliver video? Well, the first is it must be IT native. If we're saying that the IT department are very important in that decision, it has to be something they're comfortable with and something that works within the systems that they already have. Um, it must be simple. It must be something that's, that's easy to use from a student upwards or a teacher who are not necessarily trained users in, you know, in the high level sense. So it must be something that, you know, that they can deal with. Effectively, it also should be simple on IT departments and people that have to deploy it because yeah, that makes it quicker and that makes it cheaper. Mm -hmm. And the end of it, the end goal is to have an experience engaging and of high quality. What we're trying to do is make content look more televisual. We're good at watching yeah. television and we're good at taking in information from television. The news, documentaries are all ways that we currently deliver information for people to absorb. And that's the direction we really want to go. We're not just trying to put a PowerPoint or a single person speaking mm -hmm. up there. We're trying to make something that people can engage with in a meaningful way. That's what they're used to seeing, especially with the students and the tutors now. You know, we're all engaging with content online and that quality bar is raising all the time. The broadcast quality technology is almost accessible to anybody now. So education shouldn't be left behind or corporate training for that no. matter as well, really. So. And YouTube, if we look at the actual production value of some YouTube oh, yeah. clips, mm -hmm. and you know, we're, we're seeing a generation that starts with YouTube, right? Yeah. You know, whereas an older generation might Google something to find instructions, a younger generation at the moment is hitting YouTube first and then moving on from there. So they're looking for video as their yes, first exactly. call. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so uh, sort of carrying on with that, the solution should be IP based. And COTS, if you've not come across this term, it means commercial off the shelf. It should work with standard off the shelf hardware, and that's switches or servers, laptops, those kind of things. We're, we're trying to minimize the amount of specialist equipment that we run, which means that you know regular IT departments can integrate it and support it. You quite often use what you've already got as well in a lot of ways, repurpose existing networking that you've already got rather than purchasing something specific for that to, to actual use case or specific to an actual brand. You know, we're all networked now. Why not take advantage of that as we go along? You know, hundred percent. And you know, most universities have you know, and schools even have got very good gigabit Ethernet already installed. Yep. So we want to leverage that basically. Um, we want to automate wherever we can. We want to put systems in place that allow us to hit one switch or a button, you know, whatever we can do there to make it very simple. If we can automate things like what we'll call discovery protocols later on, which means your devices all arrive and say, hello, I'm a camera and I'm in this room, you know, it saves a whole lot of setup and um, it saves a whole lot of uh, change and wire. Flexibility, I mean, it's fairly obvious. We want to make systems that can be tailored for every purpose, whether it's a student with a camera right up to a, you know, a massive learning facility. Um, we need to be able to change what we do for the environment and you know, for the application at any one time. Yeah, adapt rooms as needs change and not have to be relying on specific things being taken out the walls, for example. So. Flexible yeah. spaces yes. are really, really 100%. important for a lot of people. Yep. And finally, I don't think we have a single customer in education that tells me they've got too much budget to spend. So affordable, obviously, yep. is right up there. We, we're, we're leveraging these commercial off the shelf products to keep the price point down with products that are going to work in every budget. So, um, so what? Who are New Tech? I mean, some of you might not have actually heard of us before. Uh, we've been around for well, since about the '80s. Actually, we've been around for a very, very long time. And our main aim is really to enable as many people to communicate using video as possible, to actually make their own broadcast show, and uh, to be able to communicate as easily and swiftly as possible. Now, as Mark was saying, you know, we're seeing more and more video content being produced after the last two years, and that's got no sign of slowing down. If anything, it's accelerated 
people's use of video. And so content production and actually raising the bar on that content quality production uh, is more important than ever. Now, we've all sort of got by over the last two years, but now it's about, okay, so, okay, we've moved to this sort of remote world. We will move to this hybrid production environment. How do we now start raising the quality? And a lot of the tools and technologies uh, that we've been developing at NewTek and at VizRT Group uh, are really designed to actually start raising that quality bar and the actually end user experience for those that are viewing and watching the content that you produce. Can I just uh, yeah. remind people, sorry, we <clears throat> forgot to mention this earlier on. Um, if you have any questions and you ask them as we're going along, we are monitoring the questions yep. window. And if we can, answer them while we're moving, we absolutely will, or we'll try and pick those up later. Yep, Thank and you. if we can, we'll answer some while we go along as well, where relevant. And uh, yeah, please just keep asking away uh, as we go through this. So at NewTek, we're mainly known for two main things. So firstly, is software defined production and AV. So technologies like our TriCaster product line, we've got a small example of one here, uh, have been used by major broadcasters, live streamers, content producers, and corporations uh, ever since we actually launched the TriCaster line in 2006. So we've had our technology there quite pervasive in terms of utilizing software for production. But in about 2015, we launched a technology called NDI, which is the other thing that we're mainly known for, which is an AV and broadcast over IP technology that allows you to utilize the networks that you've already got. But of course, we're not here to talk about just broadcast production here. Today, we're talking about hybrid classrooms and micro broadcasting. This is an area that we've been working in for quite some time, but we're now actually tailoring specific products to actually meet the needs of educators, trainers, corporations, like anybody that needs to simply create very simple content that can be shared and automated with your audiences. So we're going to look actually at an example of NDI in the classroom. These are abstractions based on a number of projects that universities around the UK have been doing. And I've sort of, sort of brought them all together to show you how you can start building out an AV over IP classroom using free software all the way through to a fully automated solution at the end as well. And as I said, these are all real world examples and we just feed it, fed them back into today's presentation. So one of the main drivers at the moment, the move to AV over IP, education has been doing this for quite a long time, originally with technologies like HD Base T, but actually it only really comes into its own with AV over IP when we start leveraging computers and software on those networks, not just specific hardware devices to make them work. And to do that, we are actually then actually going to be using the same Ethernet fabric throughout. This could be the same thing that you're using already for other IP protocols. It enables you to have one unified fabric. So it means that all of your devices can communicate back and forth with one another. But also crucially, as we mentioned earlier, flexibility is key. So by utilizing Ethernet and IP on your networks and using software defined protocols such as NDI on that, it means you can very easily redeploy a room because you can change the endpoints in the space, but you're not having to rip and replace the actual fabric that's in the walls or running through your building, but you can still have traditional video and audio in the actual room if you want, this becomes a network in the background. So what's NDI? Well, NDI is our AV over IP protocol called Network Device Interface, and we made it royalty free and freely available uh, to everyone in 2015. Uh, we designed it for the smallest to the largest network. So it runs on as little as gigabit ethernet, even lower. We can run it over Wi-Fi as well. Um, and is not actually then scale up. So if you have 10 gig networks, like some of the institutions we work with, or even 40 or 100 gig networks, you can simply carry more streams of video and audio around your network. Last year, we released NDI version 5, which has got some new tricks up its sleeve. But a couple of little summary things for you about it. I'm not going to go too deep into it now, but there is information freely available online. Um, but it is fully software defined. It is lightweight and very, very low latency, but it is compressed. So we use a fraction of the bandwidth of other protocols out there. And for those of you joining us today from the, AV, the IT teams, you know, typically people mention AV over IP and it's like, oh, it's going to be a lot of streaming, a lot of data mm -hmm. utilization, but we are deliberately lightweight on that network. We're not constantly sending and receiving data. So to, perhaps <clears> to give people <throat> yeah. an idea there, mm -hmm. um, if you're into networks, and this might be interested, if you're not, please ignore it because it's not important <laughs> to this at all. But really, the, the way the network works on mm -hmm. here, bitrate wise, we're talking as low as 15 megabits yep. and as high as maybe two to 50 megabits at the absolute. You yeah, know, if you're using end. 4K, yeah, we have some scalability within that. But typically, if we have a single Ethernet cable, like some of these cameras and devices here are using, you could get around seven streams of high definition in and out on a, eight, on a single gig link. 
Uh, if you're using 4K, it's free in each direction, um, but that does give you scalability. Now, one thing you'll see in a little bit is we do use human naming for this. So from your operator standpoint, they use a source name to select, and we only move video and audio when you want to send or receive it. It's not constantly pushing no. out on your network, which is a crucial thing. And for network people, <clears throat> that's a huge thing, right? Yep. Because it brings the overall bandwidth on your backbone down considerably. Yep. And that's often one of the IT enterprise kind of worries is this is going exactly. to swamp your network. Yep. It won't knock out everything you're doing on the standard network. And just that really means you're using one network to do everything, which again, keeps the prices down. And, and I would say, what, 95 times out of 100, mm -hmm. the network you've already got is plenty good enough. Yeah, majority of cases, you might want to compartmentalize it. You know, quite a lot of you in education will be utilizing uh, VLANs or virtual LANs uh, to compartmentalize that traffic. There's lots of things that we can help you with um, to actually sort of guide you on the best setup for it. But uh, typically, yeah, we're that's not it. going to be pushing a lot of data around. That's the end of the <clears> game <throat> for the time yeah, being. That's <laughs> the end of that. But in terms of resolution and format, we're agnostic. You know, we'll take mobile phones, scale up and down. So you're not kind of limited to any sort of resolution or frame rate, if that's of a concern. Um, if you want more information, you can download some free tools that you'll see shortly as part of this setup for the classroom. Um, those are available at ndi.tv forward slash tools. They're completely free for Mac and PC, so you can start building some of the examples you're about to see. And if you want to get down into the weeds on it, or if those of you actually want to develop your own services in-house, like some of the other universities and corporations that we work with, you can download the developer kit from our website and actually start integrating it into your own uh, platforms and tools that you use for teaching day to day as well. So the examples now, let's actually look, look at how these are going to work in practice. Uh, there is what's called an NDI tools launcher. This is like a menu. It uh, actually gives you instructions on how to use each tool when you download them. Uh, we're going to look at two specifically now that are really predominantly used within a teaching space, which are NDI Studio Monitor, also called Video Monitor on the Mac, or Screen Capture, uh, which is the other tool there as well. So what do these do? Well, Screen Capture means that we can take any Mac or PC computer, and we can then capture not just the screen that's actually generated on that, but also any webcam and any microphone connected to that device. This is a really, really simple way of getting uh, a tutor or a teacher directly in, or trainer directly into your network. Now, um, as well as supporting the main screen that's connected, we have an option for NVIDIA graphics cards, so you can generate multiple screens if you have them or share just one screen out on the network. And that will then transmit that into our network and then into the classroom space. At the other end, the other free piece of software is NDI Studio Monitor or Video Monitor as it's called on the Mac. And that allows you to take NDI into any computer and see it. And we'll show you that in a little bit. But it also crucially is not just for display, but also allows you to control things like cameras, even actually operate other computers. So we have a couple of universities already now actually building classrooms. If you look in uh, one of the eBooks that we produced on our website, uh, University of East Anglia, for example, have built a classroom just around these tools, which enables actually the tutor to share their screen with the whole classroom. So the classroom can then actually get their own view of what the tutor is doing. This is great thing for things like uh, CAD lessons or computer aided design, if you're teaching video editing and the like. But it means that you know, every student has a second display and they can actually see what the tutor is doing rather than all just looking on one screen in the classroom. So this is all well and good. You know, we're already sending and receiving and distributing uh, teaching around the classroom now. But what if we want to add some additional devices? Well, we mentioned earlier on about utilizing mobile applications and we have two of these. There is the NDIHX camera. This is available for Android and iOS, it will work on phones and tablets, and this will allow you to actually use your phone as a handheld camera. So we have some other universities who are actually using these during the pandemic as handheld cameras for labs. So again, they can use the 4K sensor on their phone and get up really nice and close to actually what they're actually showing and demonstrating. The other side is NDIHX Capture. Now this allows you to share the screen from any iOS device at the moment which is either an iPhone or an iPad for simple screen sharing into there's, that network. I'm glad you brought that up. Yep. So there's a question that's just come in about yep. that exact thing. Mm -hmm. When does the, H, the NDI HX Capture um, come out for Android? I believe it's being looked at at the moment. I don't have any sort of real news on anything like that at this time, uh, but we are constantly looking at this side of things uh, at the moment. So I can't really, sort of, I don't have a concrete answer for you on that. But what what I can say a little bit at. about the, the, the 
for, for all of its issues, the, the Apple world is is a lot simpler to get video going on. Ironically, yeah, um, it's a lot more stable. There's far fewer issues because of the hardware is very consistent yep. across the range, or we can pick a minimum specification. Android, because it's such a wide ecosystem, it's really uh, it's a lot harder to maintain the quality of service that we need to run an application to yep. do live streaming. So you can buy you know, an Android handset for 50 pounds mm -hmm. that can run the app, for example, that would not be able to sustain it. So to keep the support issues particularly down and keep the quality up at the minute, the, the iOS um, uh, uh, well, the iOS OS seems to be yep. a lot more stable. And ironically, our NDI tools are a little bit more advanced on PC than Mac yes. OS because Mac OS is so locked down, it doesn't do video very well. So you kind of got a bit of a balance of both. But this is a nice thing. You can mix and match the, the devices that you want to use to, to bring those in. So now in the example here, we've got a phone coming in. So this is now being used as a handheld camera by a tutor, for example. And we'll show you that in just one moment. Um, and really, this is about what we call AV over IT. This is about enabling computers and devices that you already have and that you already know uh, to actually start sending and receiving AV and actually being used as shareable contribution devices for looking at things, controlling things, but also displaying things. So what we're going to do is let's just jump out of this now. This is actually quite a good place to pop out the presentation. So let's just come out of here one minute. I think your clickers. There you go. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go on my laptop here. And uh, this is the studio monitor application I was mentioning. So this is running on my desktop. Just going to make this full screen so it's nice and clear for you all to see. And if I just right click on this, you can see I've got a menu here. So this is the name based discovery that we mentioned. Uh, these are all the different devices that we're currently running in the room. So as we go through and select those, we can actually connect to them. So if we were to say go to something like uh, a PTZ camera that I've got running here right now, this is the camera that's actually on the desk in front of me, you can now see a view of what this PTZ camera is saying. So I'll just put my hand in front, you can see that there. Now, what I can do is I can actually start controlling that with my keyboard and mouse and on-screen controls here from my own computer. So I've got direct control of that camera effectively from here, whether I'm a tutor or even a student. If I go back into the list right now and I select this one called Frank here, this is um, Mark's iPhone that he's just turned on. I'm just going to select the NDI HX camera from his device. And sharing. once that, whoop, you're, you're there not, you go. Oh, you're not screen sharing. I am screen sharing. Oh, is it stopped? Is it coming out? Okay, oh, apologies. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but you can see now that Mark's using his iPhone as a camera as part of the demonstration here. So we can actually get up close to things like the PTZ camera here that we've got running. Um, and again, once we actually start driving and controlling that, you can see on the back, I've just got one single Ethernet cable to connect to it. And then we've got an XLR in here to actually take audio directly into the camera. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, what we can do, of course, with things like this, is if I actually pop one over here, we can run multiple instances. So say I'm an educator and I actually want to get some different views. If I actually go into here, I'm just going to start a new monitor actually on the side. I just wait for that just to start up and I'm just going to bring that window from my screen over. If I now go into here, I can now go in and I can actually show you the view of the PTZ camera. We can now bring that in. I can then scale that across. Now, if I actually start moving the camera, let's just shimmy this over. You can see how ugly the system is in front of us. So I apologize yeah. for seeing our cables <laughs> and our setup, but you can but see yeah, it's very light. If you just, if you just want to show us the camera then, Mark. So if I start moving the camera around, you can see that I'm actually controlling that one directly there. So you can see the different movements that we're getting from that camera. But this is an example of how we can start generating sources and different views of things for teaching and learning in, say, a practical environment or a lab style environment, just using a laptop and using a mobile phone. So. We're not really using any sort of real expense to actually start generating those and creating those sources into the system. So let's just go back to the presentation quickly and let's just talk about another couple of little aspects uh, on that as well. So we showed you the camera just now. This is our new PTZ3 camera. This is very, very low data rate. So this is one that's actually coming at 80 megabit. Um, and what's a PTZ camera? Well, as we showed, it does pan, tilt and zoom. So these are kind of broadcast quality cameras. This particular model is high definition, but there's loads on the market, such as ones that will do 4K or lower, that can actually form part of your classroom infrastructure. Just to, yeah. I think it's often worth mm -hmm. just dropping a, sure. a number in here. I think the cheapest NDI camera that we're working with at the minute, as, as a PTZ mm -hmm. kind of camera, starts at around 800 UK yeah. pounds. Okay, so these things are not 25,000 pound cameras. Right. 
you know, there's there's an awful lot of choice, you know, uh, in, in the sort of, you know, between a thousand pounds and three thousand yeah. pounds, isn't there? And uh, there's some really good little portal ones out there as well. Um, there's a company called Mevo that I know a couple of universities are using, which are just little portable battery ones. They now do NDI, little tiny machines that they keep in stores. They're like three, four hundred pound each. They yeah. don't have any of the control that the PTZs do. Um, but again, the similar sort of idea. It's just a remote little tiny camera if you don't want to use your mobile well, device. Especially in science, you know, yeah. science experimentation, that kind any of thing. Or sport, lab. For example, yeah. practical mm -hmm. labs that are kind of things you might want to leave in place. Yep. And, and it enables you to do long term filming, capture, yep. that kind of thing. Uh, live performance as well. Um, yeah, we've got some good case studies with likes of Guildhall and other institutions that are doing live music performance and mm. you know, have all these tools at their disposal that people can use. What's great about an NDI PTZ though, uh, is that you do have pan, tilt, zoom control as you saw, but also tally. So the light will change color on screen when it's on use on the device. But we return NDI video and audio. And as we showed you, that free studio monitor can then take control of the camera on the network from the tutor or the student position. All you need to do to actually use it is select it in the list, take control. You can even use USB joysticks if you want to as well. So really nice and easy. I actually discovered the other day, if I use the arrow keys on my keyboard, I can move the camera and control it with that just from the number pad. All of that comes through one cable. So the things like this are power over ethernet. Now we mentioned a lot of this is about software. Well, it's actually software deployed on the camera and on the other devices. So there is in the SDK things for field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. So really what we're doing is applying software to hardware devices. Now, the nice thing with this is it dramatically reduces your cabling count. So again, just one plug in point into the room for the camera. You want to move the camera like a number of institutions do, unplug it, take it into another room, plug it in, you're up and running again if you configure correctly. And as we showed you on the back of this camera, particularly there is a mini XLR on there because we want to do in-room audio. You don't always want to be putting, say, a lapel mic on the tutor. I remember when I worked at a university, um, everybody just wanted a mic in the room. So you could use things like boundary mics or desk mics that are forked into the camera. That means your audio is coming to the network rather than having to muck about uh, with, with attaching mics and setting those up. So again, one neat entry point, one ethernet cable, and now we have an audio and a camera that's controllable coming into our classroom with a handheld mobile phone, with the tutor's screen and their presentation, and everyone can see it and everyone can share. So before we go ahead, there's another question relevant there to the, um, does the NDI PTZ3 come with something like 3D or something with data tracking over NDI? That'd be a really great feature for virtual sets mm -hmm. over TriCaster, VMix, and Unreal Engine. Yeah, we are, um, I can't remember if we've got it, I think we've got it on this model or it'll be coming to it. We are implementing uh, tracking data into our cameras. So like the previous model, the 4K one, that does now actually have tracking data exposed. It's quite early days uh, for that yet. Uh, but there are a number of solutions out there for tracking solutions. There are things, there are cameras out there that do NDI and 3D. Uh, there's even cameras that do auto track, so they'll follow you around the room as well. So even though we're just talking about ours today, there are plenty of options and solutions out there. And in terms of actually using that data for AR and XR, um, type or so that's extended reality and augmented reality. Uh, our parent company VizRT does have those solutions as well that we're more than happy to discuss with you on another call about how we can bring the different technologies from our groups of companies and third parties together to help you achieve those types of products. You know, we've done projects, we've done tons of those so far. So now we've got these coming into our classroom. What about our screens? What if you know some colleges and universities or corporations are saying, well, we don't want third party software installed on the laptop? Well. We number of major corporations we work with, you know, we can work with your IT and security teams to actually get through validation. Everything is signed. So quite often we can actually get those tools as part of your base install. But sometimes you want physical hardware or perhaps you want to gel in with AV infrastructure that you've already invested in. Maybe you want to sort of gradually shift into an AV over IP world. Well, converters like the Spark Plus IO that we have allow you to gel in with traditional cabling, so SDI, uh, audio, HDMI as well. We'll focus specifically quickly on the HDMI one. So this would allow you to connect a laptop or a media player or any existing HDMI generating video feed into the network. So that will bring that in, but also it can act as a decoder. So you could actually then use these to output to existing screens, smart boards, projectors that you already have, like we're doing with a number of institutions right now. Um, there are even displays now that have NDI natively in them. So NEC have modules, so you can have your video walls up and running, your traditional screens 
taking the feed out of the network. We've put some of these in some quite interesting places yeah. lately, like cafe spaces. Yeah, so it's, digital it's a, signage. Yeah, it's a cafe that could, but later on, if it's not being used as a cafe, you can use it as a learning space or yeah. performance space, bring things in and out, you know, from the physical connection on a wall yeah. box. It just takes a lot of that problem out. Yeah, we're working with uh, one university we work with right now has a multifunction event space. So sometimes it's available for corporate hire. Other times it's used for teaching, other times events. And with devices like this, it means that if, uh, say, a for hire AV company comes in, you can still give them the connectivity that they're used to, uh, but also everything can still gel together as well and then can just switch back to an AV over IP environment as well. So it gives you that additional versatility, especially if you want to start uh, leasing and renting rooms out as well at the same just time. Just sort of another point, uh, just to touch on earlier on, we talked about software drivers yes. for NDI. Yep. Um, there are a, a lot of people are, are getting involved in computer game programming mm -hmm. now. It's a yep. very, very popular courses, for example. And we've done some some gaming tournaments, for example, mm -hmm. and some you know gaming shows um, uh, that um, that run software drivers on the machines. And what's really important about that is the software driver doesn't detract from the power of the machine exactly. for the gaming. So if you're trying to show, you know, a, a class full of people playing gaming in a real environment, mm -hmm. which is exactly where that should be, yep. it saves a lot of hardware and makes it a very flexible system. So yeah, we had it with, um, so there's, there are um, N N NDIHX uh, screen capturings for NVIDIA graphics cards. So for computer science classes, computer games development classes, people teaching esports production, it's very easy to actually get those feeds in and out uh, and bring those across the board as well, which is uh, pretty powerful stuff, really. So now we've got our traditional hardware going as well. So we can bring devices in. We can also go out to existing uh, screens and infrastructure that we have as well. But we're also here, of course, here to talk about hybrid. This isn't just about how do you build an AV over IP classroom. How do we bring in remote participants? How do we reach people that are remote learners? Well, the great news here is that, again, because it's all software based, this means it's very easy for us to actually integrate the in-room with our remote participants in a number of different ways. And the easiest one of these is NDI webcam input. So this allows us to actually take the network back into a laptop and we can use it with any application that supports uh, webcam or mic. So it's almost the reverse of the studio monitor. Um, this then allows you to then input into Teams, Skype, Discord, Zoom, GoToMeeting, in fact, almost any application and actually return that. So we have numbers of customers that are doing training from everything from uh, car salesmen through to actual corporate training through to legal using this tool to actually bring people actually return the feed to them remotely. And of course, you know, using the screen capture the way you could then bring that class back into the classroom as well. So we don't actually necessarily have to leave people behind. Um, so once we start gelling that in, that means we can actually reach that remote cohort in both directions. Because it's NDI, we can throw it up on the screen in the classroom. It's and already we start gelling people together with very, very little cost, very little investment. It's incredibly powerful, this, when you yeah. realize how simple, it's a very simple thing yeah. when you start talking about it. It's incredibly powerful because there are lots of applications out there that are never going to support anything else, yeah. but they will all support a webcam. Yeah. You know, we've done full productions where we've used a TriCaster, multiple cameras, multiple mics, you know, virtual sets, mm -hmm. and the output has gone to Zoom because yep. that company only supported Zoom on their training network. Yep. That was the only platform they were allowed to use. And they weren't going to change it. You know, that was their institutional yep. rules. But we could carry on working in the NDI, keep all the flexibility of the system, yep. make it work, make it look amazing. And then just that last bit of the journey is done over Zoom using yeah. this standard plugin. And once you start understanding how that works, there are very few programs that won't work with it. It's, yeah. it's truly amazing. And it got to the point on the uptake where Microsoft actually started embedding NDI in both Teams and in Skype. So you can actually take outputs from those applications without even installing anything. You've automatically got those video feeds as NDI, which is phenomenal. Um, and again, if you look at a number of our case studies on our site from, say, the UK Supreme Court, for example, um, they built a uh, TriCaster infrastructure. So when we had a lot of the, uh, the Supreme Court cases with the government, for example, um, they've got a multi setup there, very similar to these classroom examples, but to capture each courtroom. Uh, and then they then plumb that into WebEx. So then they can actually bring in remote people uh, for legal proceedings, but they could do that very quickly because they already had the software to enable that. Okay, well, there's a couple, there's a couple mm -hmm. of questions here. One of them is quite pertinent right now, though. Yep. Are there NDI to USB webcam converters without using software? So they're hardware converters. We get asked for it a lot. Um, I believe there are some emerging on the market or starting to, um, but it's something that is a very, very popular request. There yeah. are different ways of gelling it in, though. Um, you know, there's things like uh, third-party devices that you can utilize. 
really uh, we don't produce anything ourselves yet but again because it's a raw it's a freely available open sdk there will be a vendor that will try and produce something at some point i'm sure uh if, if not ourselves uh, at one point i don't I, know but no. nothing nothing on the horizon i can talk I, about I, i've <laughs> seen um, i've seen one vendor that's doing that of that have announced but aren't shipping yet yes. so i don't think it's going to be long so um another question on hdmi is will hdmi 2.1 be implemented yeah i mean it really it, it already is technically i mean ndi doesn't really care um as long as you've got the interface there uh, our converters aren't 2.1 yet from us um, but again, you can build your own solutions using our software. You can get a capture card from any of the, the major vendors to utilize that if it uses Windows drivers, people like AJA, uh, for example, and others. Um, so there are solutions there. And again, it's a really big open ecosystem. It's not just about our product. We've made this uh, freely available to the industries for people to develop with. So if not already though, I'm sure you will see something at some point. Uh, that, that will actually already carry that for you as well. Brilliant. Thank you. And we'll just do one more yep. here. Um, uh, will there be a studio monitor equivalent app on iOS? We currently can use iOS devices sources, but how about destinations? There are, again, there's third party ones. Um, if you look at uh, Sienna or Gallery Sienna, the, uh, Mark Gilbert, those developed some actually iOS apps that you can use for exactly that purpose. Uh, there are some other third parties out there uh, as well. So if you go onto ndi.tv, you'll actually be able to find a whole marketplace of free and paid for applications and services on there. Uh, I know there's a number of them out there now that can be used. Again, not one officially from us, uh, but you know, never say never. I mean, so unfortunately, we don't really talk about what, what we're looking at, uh, but there's certainly third party solutions out there that, that will enable that for you right now. Thank you. So actually, what do we do next? Well, actually at this point, we've built a classroom up. We've kind of got sharing, we've got sources, you know, Studio Monster can record as well. Something I should point out, you can record locally any source so if you just wanted to do a test presentation to a camera you could bring that in hit record and you've got a local recording um, there are recording platforms and things like our tricaster if you want to do more complex video production enables your full recording broadcast style mixing and other production but we kind of recognize actually there's a need for something simpler in this space that can actually augment this to actually meet learning uh, online learning and lms requirements and that product is what we call CaptureCast. Now, I'll explain a little bit more about exactly what it does, but at its simplest, CaptureCast is a network appliance that can sit on your network and can actually bring NDI network sources in and actually then enable you to actually live stream out to all of the online streaming platforms. Now, that's not particularly unique, I get it. You know, there's a lot of streaming encoders out there for different classrooms at different scales. But the thing with CaptureCast is it doesn't just stream, but it also records and integrates with your learning management systems and capture systems. So we're talking things like Panopto, Kaltura, Amazon Web Services, Opencast for those that are using, and many, many more. So this appliance will actually allow you to take those sources, deliver them out. Now, the other side of it as well is it does have a full GUI for automation in there. So that allows you to create things like templates of layouts, we mentioned earlier the concept of micro broadcasting. You know, you might want to have four sources on screen or one large and one small and just record that whole session. Um, but also you might want to do things like metadata tagging. You might actually want to say, okay, well, when this class in this room is finished, I want it accessible and tagged as that class name or by that tutor. So just so, to explain mm -hmm, metadata yeah, a little mm -hmm, bit more yep. to people. So quite often there's a lot of information that's already in the calendar. Yes. So for example, or your, your learning management system, you probably know who the tutor is, you know, the room it was mm -hmm. in, the time, yep. the topic, the subject, what yep. course it was linked to, all of that information. And information that the LMS systems will already recognize. So they will actually be able to consume and use So maybe that a as description, well. for example, exactly. of what it is, yep. that can then be used to search on later on. So yep. all that information, it's not just about video, the metadata no. is incredibly important. Yeah, it's, it's what your students are ultimately going to search with and uh, and also your tutors. You know, you want to find a lecture or a lesson that happened in 2015, well, you could search for that or on a particular keyword. Um, this is things that, you know, your learning teams will actually also help you navigate if you're not already. Um, but those of you that are already using things like Moodle, Blackboard, Panopto will be familiar with the concept, but those of you new to it, it is just word-based searching uh, and tagging of that content. But the box does a bit more than that. It allows you to edit, it allows you to automate, but crucially allows you to schedule as well. So you can use, if you're using Panopto, Panopto has a scheduler inbuilt. You say, I want to book this room. The system will take the right sources and the right layout that you want and actually handle everything for you as a tutor as well and other features as well. So 
Let's look at what the workflow is in concept. I've sort of tried to simplify this as best I can. But what we're doing here with this micro broadcasting product is you're going to have the NDI sources. So on the left is our classroom. Now this could be a classroom, a campus, every source you have available. NDI does have uh, things inbuilt for creating groups. So we can create a group per room, a group for your auditorium, one for your TV studio. So if you've got a TriCaster, you're building your production studio to teach production. That can then come into the LMS system through this product as well. Um, and you can make sure that your administrator basically will grab the sources that they, you want for the template, the group as well, and say, I want this mic and this camera for this room to create this template. They will then define a canvas. So the canvas is the layout. What's it going to look like visually on screen uh, for your learners and those that access the content? But also set predefined tags for the template as well, that metadata that we were mentioning just now. So it's findable and searchable later on. And then ultimately, they will then create a target to your learning management system, whichever one you're using, and optionally, or the other way around, a streaming target. You can have either or both, however many you want. Now, you can create as many templates as you like. So every room can have a template. Each tutor could have a template for a teaching style. Maybe they use two particular devices all the time. Then that can be predefined as a template. You can have ones that bring in sources from other rooms. Perhaps you're doing an event across campus and you want to record and stream what's happening across the space. You can bring those sources together. Now, that's on the administrator end. So what we want for the tutor is that the tutor would book and schedule in. This can be done on the appliance or through our API or through things like Panopto. You can use the inbuilt scheduling there. You can then schedule that room. So you could say, right, I booked this room and I want to use this template and I want it, this lesson's going to happen at one o'clock. All of that can be done by the tutor. There's also the option to capture now. So if I'm teaching or I'm a student, I could go onto the product and say, I want to record now with this template and do an ad hoc one. Maybe I'm practicing for a lesson or a rehearsal. Maybe I'm doing a review of some kind. You can actually do on the fly capture, streaming and recording based on the templates that your administrator has created. As you said, there's no limit to the number of templates, types and layouts that you can have for different learning applications. The automation then takes over. So the automation side here uh, does the recording, the streaming. It will then, in the streaming case, it'll actually push it out to wherever you've decided that streaming target is, whichever platform you use. And that will allow you to then reach your online audience and your online learners and students as a live stream. Of course, the majority of those platforms will then cache and record that stream at the end for access later on. With the recording side, what we then do is we package up the sources that have been selected and it actually then creates what's called a media package. So that can include the original PowerPoint or presentation, any recorded sources. When people move slides, we have scene detection, so it automatically knows when it's on the next slide so you can scrub through and search it and then it will create a media package of that content that then gets uploaded to your learning management system which can then be accessed by your students later on but it encompasses everything together so you have your layout record and optionally the individual cameras the students can then go in and switch between those as well so just to be clear once that's set up mm -hmm. once that template's done yep. this is not something you're going to touch again this is all the stuff that happens under the hood it's just going yep. to work and out pops the file at the exactly end. so as far as the student uh, the actual tutor is concerned what they're doing well they're going to go in they're going to schedule it it's going to grab the right sources at the right time it's then going to record and stream if you want it to all of that is automated, so this is very, very light touch for your operators and your tutors. They can, of course, get hands on with the sources in the classroom and use them on other screens and different things. But this really allows you to concentrate on teaching while creating content in this manner that we are terming micro broadcasting on the back there as well. So as we've got a couple of minutes, let me just very, very quickly show you what that's going to look like. So if I just come out of here one second, I'll just show you the back end here a little bit very quickly, if it wants to let me out. Come on, there we go. So I've actually got the CaptureCast interface running here at the back. So this is the ad hoc screen. So we could go in and set up a very, very quick capture, give it a name. We can choose the template that's been created. So you can see there's some different templates here based on rooms. So we could select that, create a tag, say how long it is and hit start. So that will start capturing uh, based on a template if we want it to on the top menu. If we go into the template creation, this is where you can go in and create them. You can see some examples already here. So we could go in 
add a template, and this allows you to then create what you want to do. So if you just want to type something in there for us, Mark, and yeah, whatever you want. And then here's the tags at the bottom. Whoop, sorry. <laughs> so we could then put a tag, so that's what's going to be searchable later on at the end. And then as you go through, you then go down. So here are the NDI sources that are currently available to this product. So I want to grab, say, the document camera and the PowerPoint. I'm just going to hit next. And then here is where you then create your canvas. So then we could then go in and start creating the layouts. So this is where we add the sources. You bring those in. You can choose what audio source you want to use, adjust the scale. This is all the stuff that the, the administrator is going to do. This is actually already uh, pre-built for you. And then you can actually adjust the layout and move those around uh, as you want to go through the system. Uh, you then choose your targets. This is where we're going to go to your learning management system or onto an FTP server. Finally set up the live streaming. And then we move into actually suggesting you know, what sources do we want to capture? Which one do we want to monitor when people flick through? All of this is, is predefined in the back template on the system and then gives you a nice little summary at the end. So this takes all the guesswork out of it. You know, it's allowing us to create that automation and, and predefined running for what the system is going to do. When the template's created, uh, we can go into the schedule, and then that is where we could import an existing calendar or link into uh, things uh, like Cellcat and the other systems that you're using or Panopto management. And when you book on that, you then say, right, I want to use that template with that layout by room, by course type, by class book it in, schedule it, and then really everything else is automated for you. So it doesn't take long for, from an administrator standpoint for your admins and your IT team to actually start managing that. But once you've actually started creating content, if we go into here some examples, uh, you can see that there's some example layouts that have been done here. So if I open this Chem 101 example class here on the system, this is what would get sent over to your learning management system. So we've got uh, a really rough and ready template done here, but this could have your college branding as a graphic or your corporate branding on the background. Uh, we can go through and review, but crucially, we don't just have to look at the picture and picture layout because the capture cast box has recorded the individual sources. So depending on your learning management system, the tutor, the students and tutors can then switch between those cameras themselves later on, not just the individual camera. Um, or the mix output, so we can change and mix through that. I think that's now, incredibly important once you see how powerful that is. Because exactly. If you're, you know, your, your requirements for watching a chemistry tutor, you know, close up doing an experiment will be very different from somebody, you know, yeah. looking at a, a, a regular lesson, and, and you get to look at that thing that's mm -hmm. actually important to you at that time. Yeah, and unlike other sort of picture-in-picture -picture systems, you know, you're not stuck on a particular layout or template. So a lot of the other capture systems will give you a few options. This is completely adjustable, completely brandable to what you want, but again, takes that guesswork out for the tutor and for the people actually developing the training so they don't have to be a broadcast operator as well. So just to move on very quickly, because we've got a few minutes left and also you want to get to the Q&A, um, this does scale out to multiple rooms. Each product is designed to drive multiple rooms, so it'll handle any eight NDI sources at once, which you could divide up between rooms. So eight rooms with one source each or four rooms with two sources each and so on. So there is scalability. It's not a room per box, and let's say you're building an auditorium. Um, as you add more rooms, as you want to scale out, you simply add more units. And as you add more units, eventually we have something called the CaptureCast Command Center, which allows you to centrally manage all of these appliances. So it gives you full elasticity, full scalability, it allows you to then actually access NDI across your entire campus, across your buildings, uh, and across the board as well. But there is one last bit I just want to show you very quickly, which is pretty cool, which is NDI Bridge, because we've been talking about in the classroom, we've been talking about in the campus, but what about if I'm working from home, and I want to operate a system or want to control a camera? What if heaven says, you know, we can end up in another lockdown, we might want to access the systems and set up classrooms for people. Uh, maybe we want to link campuses and actually collaborate. Well, another free software we have is called NDI Bridge which allows you to link networks together over wide area network over public internet. So this will work on VPNs, it will work on WANs, it will work on your education networks between establishments, but it's a very, very powerful tool to enable you to teach remotely, but also bring in remote contributors. So very, very swiftly, what I'm just gonna do just before we just do some more questions, I'm just gonna come out and go into the bridge application that's running here. 
Um, now, I can show you more information on another time for those who want to see it, but I have an encryption key. This is locked, so nobody else can access this. I've shared some information with a colleague in Germany, and I'm just going to hit the Join button. What that's going to do is this will actually then initialize a connection uh, over to my colleague in Germany, all being well. This is a bit where the, the live demo doesn't work for me today, <laughs> isn't it? But what will then happen in turn is once that's actually joined, yeah, if he's gone offline. <laughs> Perfect. But what will actually normally happen is this would actually allow me then through the same free software and the other applications to bring the NDI feeds um, across so I can connect that to anywhere in the world. So I've connected to mobile phones in Africa, systems in America and back and forth. And in terms of how um, you so see that, they would just appear like another local device on the network. There'll be a yeah. group that's, a, that's this other area, mm -hmm. and then I could just pick the devices I'm allowed to see from there as if it was a local yeah, device. Yeah, they will, they will just come up in the same list. So what would actually occur is back down in the uh, studio monitor application down here. If we were to go into that list, there will be a bridge application that appears, and that just allows us to start gelling that back and forth and bring those across the board. So we do have tools and technologies there to go beyond your building, beyond your campus, um, and actually connect with other people. So maybe you don't want to use video conference or have remote cameras at other so, sites so or the, other facilities you've got, but you want them to come into your learning system. So perhaps a good, a, a good explanation of, of where that might be. When you're using a system like Zoom or Teams, you don't have control over the no. quality of the video, do you? It's no. very much who's on it, what they want you to yep. do for that platform at the time. Yep. They're not video first platforms. No. So this way you can pick the quality of the video coming over. Mm -hmm. You can be much higher quality. You know it's going to be more yep. robust. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way that you're able to do things you just wouldn't be able to do over, over say, a Teams call because they can, yep. you know, at peak times look a little bit you know, uh, yeah. worse on the quality because it's not their prime game, right? It's exactly. not what they do. And, then, and so the key bit is you have the encryption on this as well. So you know, if you don't have the key, you're not getting in. It's the same encryption used by banks. for It's called AES-256, for those of you who may have heard of it, but it's completely locked down and secure. But it's fantastic if you have remote facilities. You might be a university or a campus with satellite offices that you want to actually bring in as part of presentation but still have broadcast quality cameras there. Again, helps you save on budget, helps you keep those costs down to bring that together. Um, just to wrap up, we do offer different levels of support for people. So again, we can help you stay up and running up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you want. And where I sit within the business is professional services. So we can help you design and also tackle things beyond our product. So you can actually help you design API integration. Um, that's a service that we can also provide you. Uh, if you want more information or you want to learn about using NDI, say your IT team, or you actually want to learn about using our exact products as well, we have New Tech University. If you are an educator, please do get in touch with me directly or any of my colleagues, and where we can have a chat about getting you access to those courses uh, as an educator. Uh, but if you're a corporate company as well, please get in touch with Digibox. They can talk about pricing for access for training and certification. And of course, you get all the learning material so you can teach with it as well. We're not sort of holding that back. It's there for you to learn to teach other people. Um, and that's available at newtech.com, newtech.u. Finally, if you want to book a demo with anything, go to newtech.com forward slash demo. If you click on the Europe button, you can actually book with myself or my colleague Zoltan directly. And we can talk about any specifics and go into deeper aspects of any product. Uh, including CaptureCast uh, and actually meet your requirements and you can bring as many colleagues uh, as you want there and uh, we're happy to sort of help and assist you wherever we can um, as well. Okay, there's a few questions we can answer just straight yep. away here mm -hmm. from that. Um, when does the Capture Car Cast get released? Are demo units available? So. Yeah, Capture Cast is available now. Um, we are actually starting to ship uh, this week. Uh, we are taking pre-orders right now, but we're, we're producing them very, very quickly. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, shipping right away, so it's available for order and demo units. Um, it, we, if you want a demonstrator to try out, uh, please get in touch with Mark or myself, and uh, you know we can make arrangements for you to get hands on and have a look at things as well. I think my colleague in Germany is controlling my camera right now. Hi, Toby. I think that, yeah, the bridge is working, so Toby's back. <laughs> That's what's going on. I'll show you that very quickly in a minute, but we'll, we'll do that. Stay, stay on there. All right. <laughs> so this, so this is what happens. A <laughs> couple of other, uh, couple of other points. Can Capture Cast stream in the local network? I yeah. inside a school for viewing uh, yeah. as it was possible before with the media DS. Yeah, hands down. It's RTMP and RTSP. The only thing it doesn't do is allow actually provide the host for people to connect to. But there are plenty of solutions out there that allow you to create your own web server internally. So you could use things like VLC, uh, et cetera. It's a slightly different product to the media DS. So it doesn't have that hosted streaming capability. But again, if you get in touch with me, we, we can talk about the specific requirements there. 
Okay, and one final question. This is regarding the Spark Plus. Yep. Will it encode and decode simultaneously, or do no. I need one for each process? It's, um, you can switch it, but it's not simultaneous decode. It has a pass-through. So if, say, you've got an existing AV infrastructure with your screens and your projectors, but you don't want to change that, but you want to then break out to AV over IP, still moving the camera, um, you can then connect back and forth. Um, you can actually loop it out to your existing AV, but it really is one way or the other. We do have products that offer simultaneous encode and decode called the NC2IO. Um, we, there are other third parties out there that do offer that. But again, do get in touch with us. We can talk through the options, not just ours, but those are the rest of the ecosystem that's out there um, as well. So um, if we... Many, many thanks, gents, um, mm -hmm. for that really um, exhaustive and, and kind of informative session. Um, we will be, this has been recorded, so we will be posting uh, links to this whole session um, afterwards if you've missed a bit or you had to leave for whatever reason. Um, we will be posting these online or through social media channels and stuff. But um, many thanks to uh, Mark and Liam for your time. That's fantastic. Thanks, gents. And, Thank uh, you. Many thanks to everyone for joining us today. Goodbye. Thanks a lot.